Okay, right on. Hey, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dean Weda. I am the ALC uh, Finance Chair and um, bringing to you today um, our guest Dan Falardo from New Direction Trust Company. Before he gets into the presentation, I kind of wanted to share why this topic is near and dear to me personally. Um, you may or may not know, but I've been Prior to working in real estate sales, I was an accountant and CPA for 20 years, and I was a W-2 employee working for in the private industry. And, you know, not so good thing you have a boss, but some good things about working for a company is that there's uh, systems and structures in place. Uh, one of those would be, you know, some entities offer retirement uh, plans like pensions or 401ks. So, you know, being around that, you know, when enrollment happens, sometimes you're talking to your employees, your coworkers about how much should I put in and, and um, you know, what funds are, are going to put stuff into. So it's, you're around it. And so as an employee, I feel like that kind of stuff was always compulsory in terms of saving up for retirement. Um, on the other hand, when I got into real estate sales, I felt like it was kind of, you know, we're our own business owners. It's kind of like the wild, wild west. And no one's there telling you to be saving for retirement and for the future. So I think this topic is very important. Um, also, the fact that, um, you know, when you're investing, so now we're investing, investing, but when you're, you have a 401k plan or pension plan with these, these employers, they're, good because you're saving but the downside is your your administrator probably offers you only a handful of options in terms of a few funds to offer this product that we're going to talk about um, off, offers a lot more options in terms of alternative investments so that's why i think it's very important and i'll segue to dan Flardo from new direction trust company thanks Steve. thanks Good morning. Let's see. We in here? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> hey everybody. Good morning, Chelsea. Um, all right. So I'm gonna go ahead. Good morning, Alan. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Dan Falardo with New Direction Trust Company. Um let's see. We got left, right, up, down. We start with our disclaimer. Uh, we are neutral custodians, so we don't sell any products, we don't give any advice, and we support the client's IRA, but it's a self-directed IRA, and the self is the client. So what that means, we'll go through in the presentations, but I'd like to start out by telling people, if you need advice, go to your financial advisor, see your accountant, talk to your tax attorney, anybody that you know might have information about that to help you personally in your situation, it's always advisable to talk to people. Since we are neutral custodians, we can tell you what you can and cannot do, but we don't tell you what you should or should not do. That's always up to the client. That's the self portion. So what is a self-directed IRA? The self-directed IRA is the same as every other IRA. We follow the same IRS codes. It is, the difference is the custodian. So we allow our clients to invest in any asset that's legal by the law that the client wants to. So like I said, we don't give advice on what they're going to invest in, but we are the custodians that hold the assets. So the IRA is the same types of accounts that you may or may not have all heard of that will be on the next slide. It's just a descriptive term to say that this is self-directed from the client. So typically we're talking about real estate since you're all in real estate and that is our number one client asset in Hawaii. We'll be focusing on real estate, but these are the different types of accounts that you may or may not have seen. Tax deferred and tax free. Tax deferred sounds great, but what sounds better is tax free. So how do you make something tax free is by paying the taxes. That's the conversion into the Roth. So that you may not need to do that, but that's uh, these are the different types of plans. The traditional IRA is 
the individual retirement account. So even though all of these are self-directed accounts, just so you know. So if you have a SEP or a simple or solo K or a traditional Roth, all of these can be self-directed. We are self-directed custodians. So therefore the clients are using one of these types or two of these types of accounts to hold real estate. So individual accounts, the I is individual for IRA and the traditional IRA is tax deferred. In that situation, you're making annual contributions to the IRA and you're getting the tax deduction for making that contribution. So this is always a CPA question. Whoever's helping you with your taxes is how much money can I contribute to lower my tax taxable income for the year? Now, the Roth IRA is the opposite. This is after-tax money. You've already paid the taxes on it. So this is contributions going to be after-tax money. So when you put in a Roth, all the growth is tax-free instead of tax-deferred in the traditional accounts. So the kind of opposites. Now, the health savings accounts, we don't really have them in Hawaii because the HSA is for high deductible health insurance plans, which on the mainland, there's lots of clients we have. First of all, we have about a thousand clients locally and about 50,000 clients on the mainland. And I focus with the Hawaii clients. So um, HSAs are popular on the mainland. Here in Hawaii, we have the state said can't have those kind of high deductible health insurance plans. So they don't really work here unless you happen to have a client who's Working on the mainland or for a company on the mainland remotely here, sometimes that happens as well. So employer plans, since most realtors are independent business owners, it's you. You are the owner. You are the boss. You are the boss of you. Uh, so you're two separate people. You're the employer and the employee. So the simplified employee pension is called a SEP IRA. So you may have one of these. You may have heard of these. You may have clients that are independent business owners that you know, maybe they're dentists or doctors or you know small business owners where the, the business is just them, just like a realtor would be. Sometimes realtors don't think that you know they have a business, they're just self-employed, they would say. But self-employed means that you're employed by yourself to yourself. So the simplified employee pension is really the way to go. The SEP IRA has larger annual contributions. When you're a W-2 employee and you're working for somebody and there's a 401k plan, for example, then you're going to contribute some money and then the company is going to contribute some money to the 401k plan. The SEP is the same way. As the employee, you're going to contribute some money and you as the employer is going to contribute more money. So on a traditional IRA, when it's just the individual, not an employer, $7,500 a year for annual contributions. So that's new money going into your IRA, not transfers or rollovers, but new money going in. It's a very small amount. So if you're starting out and everybody starts out sometime, you're going to have $7,500 is going to be your annual cap for a traditional IRA. But the employee pension, excuse me, the simplified employee pension, the SEP IRA, has 25% of your annual income or $57,000 each year of new money contributions. Now that's, that's tax deductible. So you're making those contributions and you're being able to, to deduct that off of your taxes. So the SEP is the way to go. If you're a successful realtor and you're making, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, it might help you to lower that by $57,000. And that's always going to be the question for your CPA. If you have a SEP is how much can I contribute this year? Or the CPA will be telling you how much you can contribute. Hey, if you want to lower your taxes to the next tax bracket down, potentially, then you need to contribute $50,000 or whatever they might tell you. But the SEP IRA is something you should look into if you're a realtor and you don't have a W-2 401k plan from another company, then you might consider having a SEP because you're able to put a lot of money in there and lower your taxable income for the year. So SEPs are the way to go. 
Simples are also for employer plans. It's when you're matching yourself with small employers and solo 401ks. All of these accounts are self-directed accounts. So we say there's three easy steps to setting this up is open the account. Our application is on, on our website funding the account and purchasing the asset. So funding the account is going to be either, like I was talking about making annual contributions to your IRA, but the majority of IRAs are being funded from old 401k rollovers. So if you have a, a previous job and you were there for a long time and you did your 401k and you left, that 401k is still there, but you're no longer contributing, you're no longer an active plan participant. So if you want access to those funds to make investment choices, you'll want to do a rollover. So the rollover is changing from the 401k to the IRA. It's not a taxable transaction. It stays within a qualified retirement plan. It's just moving its shape from being a 401k employer plan to being an individual IRA plan. So just know that if you have clients that are interested in investing in real estate with you and they have worked for another company for a long time, but now they've moved, transitioned into a new company, they might have an old 401k plan. And a lot of people have old 401k plans. Or perhaps they just have an IRA that's with a different custodian, Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, like that, but they don't, they're not allowed there to invest in real estate. They want to invest in real estate. They need to have a self-directed account. If someone only wants to invest in mutual funds, they don't need a self-directed IRA. But if they want to invest in something alternative to mutual funds, then they need a self-directed IRA because where they are is most likely not going to allow them to invest in, in real estate. And then step three is purchasing the asset and that we have a lot of, a lot of different clients come up with a lot of different assets, right? It's a self-directed account. Clients come to me and say, I want my IRA to invest in that. And sometimes it's very unique and sometimes it's strange even, but uh, typically it's just a rental property. So I don't think that's too exotic when it comes to assets being held in, in a retirement account, uh, but typically it is a rental property and we'll go over. So, there are rules to follow, right? So the IRS, nobody wants to mess with the IRS as far as breaking the rules. People like to know what the rules are so they can get close to breaking the rules without breaking the rules. These are prohibited transactions. So as the custodians, we try to keep the clients on the straight and narrow, not breaking rules. And prohibited transaction is one and disqualified people is the next one, which is the next slide. So prohibited transactions. This is when you're doing something that you probably couldn't do with a Fidelity account, for example. You're not going to have a lot of options to have prohibited transactions when you're investing in, in uh, mutual funds, right? You're not going to sleep in the mutual fund. You're not going to lend your mutual fund. But when you have a self-directed account, you have more options and how to structure things, and it could be prohibited transactions. So I like to use real estate a rental property as the asset, as an example. So selling something you own to your, or buying from your IRA, you can't sit on both sides of a table and negotiate with yourself. You're not gonna make the best deal for your IRA. So you need to have a new investment, something that you don't personally already own or under contract. So when it comes to a rental property, this is something that you don't own that condo already and selling it to your IRA. That's a prohibited transaction. So it needs to be a new investment that you don't already own. Lending money or extending credit, the IRA is a separate entity from yourself. So that is, you are able to, for example, if you're getting a mortgage for yourself, you're absolutely able to show the IRA as you know how much money is in there, what are the assets, it makes you look good by having a nice retirement account when you're trying to get a mortgage, but you can't pledge the money in your IRA because it is separate from you. Providing services to the IRA, this is often we have clients that are handy with a hammer. They want to 
improve something. They want to make a buy, fix and flip, for example. So when it comes to that with the IRA, the IRA is the owner of the property and needs to pay for improvements to that property and it can't be you. So we'll get to that on the next slide, but just know that sweat equity is a prohibited transaction. So if you want to have a four bedroom house become a five bedroom house that your IRA owns, the IRA needs to pay the contractor that's not you to be to do that improvement. So uh, personal use of the plan assets. This is the, the number one thing that people are like, well, what if, what if that? So uh, if you have a Waikiki vacation rental and nobody's staying there this weekend, clients are always, well, can I use it? There's not anybody staying there. You know, I might even pay the, the market rate for the rental property, which is going to themselves, which is a prohibited transaction. So I tell them, look, you don't want to have a paper trail that said on this date, it was blocked for the owner's use. And that's that's not good, right? You don't want there to be anything to find if there were ever to be an audit by the IRS looking at your, you know, your personal information and they look in your IRA and say, hey, what about this? You don't want that. So don't use personal assets. Use assets as a fiduciary and getting paid by your IRA all fall around providing services. So really just think of this as an investment, not some place you're gonna go stay, not some place that you're going to put some sweat equity into. It needs to be separate from yourself. So that is the prohibited transactions. And you know, there's more, every situation is different, but those are the basic rules about prohibited transactions. The other rule is disqualified people. So this one is very important because going back to that Waikiki vacation rental that nobody's staying in this weekend, or in general, a rental property that your IRA owns. So disqualified people are in the red, the ascendant, descendant family line, up and down from you, the IRA holder, you are a disqualified person from having direct relations with your IRA. You haven't paid the taxes on that money that's owning the property yet, therefore the rules need to be followed by the IRS. There's really not that many rules. Most things are a yes, not a no, but we do need to go over prohibited transactions and disqualified people. So who can stay? Let's just say it's not a vacation rental. That's a long-term rental. Let's say it's a long-term rental and you're looking for a tenant. Who can stay and be the tenant? You cannot. And your spouse and your parents and your grandparents and your children and your grandchildren, the ascendant, descendant family line, the IRS says these people are too close to the IRA holder that they would not be making a good deal for the IRA. You might have a rental property that you want to put your mom into that you're going to pay the rent to the IRA. And that is definitely a disqualified person handling a tri uh, prohibited transaction. So while your mom might need a place to stay, don't put her in your IRA owned asset. The difference here are periphery relatives in the green. So these people are a little further away. The IRS says they are non-disqualified. So interestingly enough, the IRS has disqualified people, which are for sure a no, and non-disqualified people, which are in the green. But there are no qualified people because the IRS won't go quite that far to say these people are Good, yes, absolutely, but non-disqualified. So non-disqualified people, this could be your brother, siblings, right? These people on the periphery of you, not your ascendant, descendant family line. So if your brother wanted to rent the property, he could rent it. Hopefully he's gonna pay the rent. You're not just helping your brother that's not gonna pay the rent. You're trying to grow your IRA by rental income and the assets it holds for your retirement. This is about you, the individual, planning for your retirement. So your retirement is going to buy a condo and it's going to have rental income coming in that's feeding into your IRA every month. So that's the plan, not your brother needs a place to stay. But legally, 
your brother could be the tenant and all of the other and so on. All right. So in the real estate world, titling is very important. And we work with all the title companies. It's always up to other entities, you know, the buyer, the seller, whoever agrees on which title company to use. But it's important to know that the IRA is going to be the one entering into this contract. And you want the IRA to be listed as the owner. Earnest money needs to be coming from the IRA, not from your pocket. So this is something that realtors, I have to repeat myself often about this, and it's it's been 15 years I've been doing this, and it's fine. But nobody likes to have to get a new contract, right? You get under contract under John Doe's name, and John Doe's $5,000 earnest money, and then he says, oh, I want this to be an IRA asset. You cannot do an amendment. You cannot do an addendum. You cannot change John Doe's contract into John Doe's IRA. That is a prohibited transaction. It goes back to the other slide about buying and selling something you already own. Well, the IRS looks at it as you're under contract. You may not physically own that, but you are the one that's giving permission for this owner to change to that owner, which that is the prohibited portion. So um you may not have seen a titling look like this before but this is the way it needs to show and in general it's the custodian on the left the fbo in the middle means for the benefit of and then client's name ira is on the right hand side so new direction trust company trustee for the benefit of john doe's ira it's a very long title but it needs to be on the offer. It needs to be in the paperwork. It needs to have the money coming from the IRA to buy this. This is the IRA buying something, not John Doe giving it to his IRA to buy. So sometimes clients like to have their name on everything because they have comfort in that. And sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes clients don't want their name anywhere. They just want their account number and the custodian to be showing on the deed. Um, Earnest money, now often when you have a new client that is opening a self-directed IRA, and that doesn't take very long at all, maybe 20 minutes to open the account, but the funding step, the step two, that rollover or the transfer, that can take two weeks. It could take a while. You know, we put in the transfer request, let's say to Schwab, send over $400,000 to the IRA. Schwab's not going to do that overnight. They will do it. There's never, you know, they will do it when there's a request made, but it takes a little bit of time. And what happens is when it's a new client and it's a new account and there's not money in the account yet, but the client wants to put down an offer with earnest money on that condo that they just can't live without for their IRA, but they don't have any money for the earnest money through the IRA. They can use a non-disqualified person. The IRA can pay back a non-disqualified person but not a disqualified person. So if your brother happens to come up with $5,000 earnest money, he can put that down because your account doesn't have any money in there yet. It will. And then the IRA can pay back your brother, the non-disqualified person for the earnest money, either as soon as the funds are in there or as a line item on the settlement statement. It's always up to the client to decide on that. But it's just important to know to think that this is an entity that you control, that you put money into, that you decide what it's going to invest in, but it needs to show that entity, the IRA as the owner, and the money for the investment that the IRA is making is coming from the IRA itself, or at least a non-disqualified person to put to pay that person back. So this is this is important because like I was saying about John Doe's contract and his earnest money cannot be changed into his IRA. It needs to be a new contract. Nobody likes to have that. So it's nice to do it right the first time instead of having to go to the seller's agent and say, hey, all of the information is the same, but we need to get that earnest money back and we need a new contract to show the IRA. Even though everybody's still making the same commissions, it's a pain in the butt and nobody wants to have to go through that. But this is the way to do it. If you do it right the first time, you don't have to have that new contract. 
And this hey, happens Dan. often, just so you know. Yes. A uh, question. Um, yes, Alan. Can the um, can the IRA be, I guess, owned or controlled by a trust, or does it need to be like a person? Can like like the for benefit of client name mm. be a trust? The trust comes in under the beneficiaries portion, so it is the IRA as the owner. When that person passes away, that's when the trust comes in as the beneficiary. Okay. So, so the it's trust not, itself it, is, cannot the trust be trust itself is, it, is a separate entity that the asset of the IRA goes to when okay. the person passes. But it, so it has so to be yes, tied to a person. If you have a trust, okay. it is shown as the beneficiary to the IRA when they pass. Okay. Then whatever the rules of the trust are, kick in. Thanks. Sure. Self-dealing, go over this one quickly. This is like I was talking about before, when you own something, your IRA can't buy it from you. You need to have an arm's length from your IRA to have tax advantages. When there's nothing to stop you from self-dealing, then it's personal money. Personal money is money that you get taxed on in the year that it happens, right? If you make $1,000 that year, that's gonna show on your income. So no tra transactions between these. That's why you need a custodian to have the for the benefit of portion or else it's just personal money. So you're a disqualified person, your IRA is a separate entity, you're the one that directs everything, but you need to make sure that there is something that is stopping you from touching that money that you haven't paid the taxes on. That's the way the IRS looks at it. So owners pay the expenses, right? So the IRA is the owner, excuse me, and pays the expenses, but it gets the income. So this brings up the topic of property managers. Do you need a property manager or you don't need a property manager? That's again, to the client. It's a self-directed account. There's a lot of things the client can do that are like a property manager, but not being a paid property manager. Some clients have all the time in the world. Maybe they're already retired. Maybe they want to be the unpaid property manager that handles duties like paying the AOAO and the property taxes and the insurance and things. We have a very nice client portal that doesn't cost you anything. There's not a per check fee. The client can log in and say, okay, pay the insurance for the next six months. We send out a check the next business day. It comes from the IRA, and it that's part of the expenses it takes. The income is going back into the IRA. How is that income going, coming in? The rent can be old-fashioned check in the mail. The rent can be through the portal where the tenant pays directly to the client's IRA, or there could be a property manager. Some clients are still working and don't want to be micromanaging their retirement investment. So there's a property manager. So the property manager works like any other property manager would. They take in the rent, they find the tenant, you know, they get the 3 a.m. call, they take their fee, of course, and then they send the net income back to the IRA. So when there's a property manager, we try to get them to cover, to pay as much of the expenses as possible, right? So there are expenses that the tenant will pay and there are expenses that the tenant doesn't pay that the owner pays maybe it's the garbage or the sewer or you know those types of bills that need to be paid property manager can pay those bills and send the net amount back to the ira so again there's a lot of choices with a self-directed ira and there are a lot of choices when it comes to real estate so whatever your client is interested in maybe you're the client maybe you have found a property that you think would be a nice fit for your retirement account to own uh these are some examples single family multifamily, condos most popular is condos commercial properties you might have a hui that goes together and buys a commercial strip mall for example Least fee interests are a very uniquely Hawaiian investment that we have a lot of clients that buy the fee on a leasehold property. And the lease rent goes back to the IRA. At the end of the lease, it diverts back to the fee owner. So the lease is gone because it has ended, it's terminated. 
and the leasehold client doesn't own anything anymore because it ended and the fee simple property is now the property of the IRA. So several years ago, there were a lot of these that was through Kamehameha Schools, Bishop Estate, and they were selling lots of lease fee interests. And those were going for $150,000, $200,000. That's not a lot of money. You have to wait until the lease is over. Maybe there's 20 years left on that lease, but it's a retirement account. So it's not money you need tomorrow because you're probably not needing your IRA funds tomorrow. So lease fee interests are a very unique Hawaiian asset, and they also fit nicely with people's retirement plans. And it's you don't need a half a million dollars to start with. So that's a nice thing. Um, unimproved land, improved land, like land on the big island. Land on the big island is always an interesting topic because there's probably not going to be a rental tenant, right? Nobody's paying the property taxes. There's not a lot of expenses either, but there are some expenses that need to be paid and those need to be paid by the IRA. So let's just say it was $5,000 property tax, overall bills for the year. You need to have that cash to pay the bills through the IRA. We did have a client that got bought with this IRA, 10 acres of North Big Island, outside of Waikoloa area, and the neighbor had cattle, and he had grazing rights on the IRA-owned asset, and it was just enough to pay all the expenses for the year. So he let the cattle graze on his land, the rancher paid the IRA, the IRA then had money to cover the expenses of the property taxes, and then the developer came along and said, I want to buy that 10 acres and develop, and he was like, I made a good investment because I bought it cheap because it was just raw land. And then it turned into a development in north north end of uh, the Big Island. Sometimes you could be the mortgager. You, you could be the lender to somebody else. So you could be like the banker. If you had a half a million dollars in your IRA and you had somebody that was a non-disqualified person, your IRA could lend them money and it could be a secured note by the property. Foreign properties are fine. Lease fee interest. People always ask about, you know, can I buy leasehold? Leasehold is fine in an IRA. Sometimes that cash flow is huge on a vacation rental. And even though the value is diminishing as the end of the lease gets closer, the current cash flow coming in from that vacation rental is definitely an interest to clients that are looking at something. Obviously, it's going to be less expensive typically with. Um, a leasehold. I'm going to make this go down. What do you think? Can I get to the lower one? What do you think, Dane? I don't know how to make that one go down anymore. Thank you very much. All right, let's scroll down now. Oh, I thought it was there. You still go want to go ahead. Want to ah, there. Why don't you just lower it down to the end? Perfect. Thanks. Again, there's choices about life. So, so sometimes you buy a nice property and it's got a tenant in there already. And then the IRA just, it's a very simple process because the tenant's already paying rent. Uh, sometimes it's fix and hold, buy, fix and flip. You know, there's all different types of things. Maybe, maybe it's a $250,000 fix your IRA needs to have the money for the fix. That's just an important process. So if you're spending all the money, it's a cash deal. And just so you know, most of the deals are cash deals. Um, I'll get to the financing in just a moment, but it is typically a cash deal. And you need to know if it needs some fixing and there's no tenant, then there needs to be enough funds in the IRA to cover the fix. If there's a tenant, well, you can do it 
as the rent comes in, or you could borrow on that. So funding your account is either going to be a transfer from another IRA, a rollover from a 401k, direct rollovers are the same when it comes to being, it's just movement of funds, and then annual contributions to the SUP, for example. But that's how you get money into the IRA, is by contributions. All right, so you can hold, as the owner of the IRA can be on title, often people always say, I don't have quite enough money in my IRA to do that investment. So sometimes they can partner. They could be tenants in common and with a percentage of ownership. And the, that other tenant, in my experience of 15 years, is typically the spouse. So this spouse has an IRA and that spouse has an IRA and they buy one single property that is own tenants in common, depending on the money going in, then it's going to be uh, that percentage of ownership. Then it's really great to have a property manager at that point because property manager is gonna take in the rent, pay the bills and send the net about back to each of the tenants in common in their percentage. And it's kind of difficult to get the tenant to pay two different owners on the rental side. So if you have tenants in common, it works well, um, but you often need to have a property manager in that situation. Like I was saying before, you could be the lender, you could be the mortgager, and that would be using the property as collateral. It would be a secured uh, promissory note with the property. So that is one way, you know, if the tenant, if the borrower doesn't pay, then you can collect on the property, your IRA would. And you can also invest in an entity that owns in an IRA. So often when it's a HUI, it's an LLC, let's say you have five different investors going in, the asset becomes the LLC and each of the IRAs or, or members are different memberships with differing percentages and the IRA could be one. If you see an investment that you, interests you, your IRA could most likely invest in that as well. All right, so this is step, this is one level up from the 101 intro, but I like to cover because everybody always asks when people buy real estate, they often have a mortgage, right? There's not, there are cash buyers out there, of course, but the majority of buyers in real estate are getting financing. So when it comes to an IRA, the majority of the IRA purchasers are cash, but the question always comes up about a mortgage. So the IRA is allowed to have debt. It is allowed to get a mortgage. It's called a non-recourse loan. So the non-recourse loan is the IRA entity itself, not you, John Doe, as the owner of the IRA. It's not your credit score. It's not your income. You can be a great person, pay your bills for your whole life, great credit score. That's not what the lenders are looking at. The lenders are looking at the IRA have has money and how much skin in the game does it have? So they're looking for 40 to 50% down payment. Um, there's no personal guarantee from the IRA holder. And that's typically what a mortgage lender is looking for a personal guarantee. I personally guarantee to pay this back. But when you're not the borrower, when you're the IRA, the IRA is the, is the borrower. So there's not a personal guarantee when it comes to non-recourse loan, it's to the IRA. And there aren't any that I know of local lenders that are doing non-recourse loans for IRAs, except for commercial properties. So you probably can't get one single condo, but you might be able to mortgage an, an apartment building, for example. There are quite a few of those that are Mouilili, for example, you know, three-story walk-ups, and that it's owned by an IRA that has a mortgage, and there's you know eight, 10. 20 apartments there paying the mortgage and the IRA. So it's that works really well. But when you take in outside money that is not qualified retirement money, some of those profits get taxed. So when you have a cash deal with the IRA, let's just use a $500,000 example. So the IRA has $500,000. It buys a $500,000 rental property. The tenant pays the rent, the $2,000 a month back to the IRA, there's not unrelated business income tax for that. It works well. You don't have to worry about unrelated business income tax because there's not a mortgage. 
when the IRA has $500,000 and it gets a $500,000 non-recourse loan, that's outside money that's not inside the IRA already. So now it has a million dollars to buy a million dollar property. But in fact, only 500,000 is IRA money. So the rental income with no mortgage was $2,000 a month. Let's say it's $4,000 a month to rent the million dollar property. So some of that $4,000 is going to be taxable because that is the portion from the mortgage side. So is the net profits from the percentage of the mortgage that is the unrelated business income tax. Nobody really likes to talk about taxes with a retirement investment. That's why most of the time it's just a cash deal. But sometimes if you crunch the numbers in a specific investment, sometimes that $4,000 rent from the million dollar property there's enough extra profit in there to make it worth your while instead of just buying with cash. Just so you know, it's not impossible, but it's not for every deal. Okay, so when we were talking about the um, personal guarantee, the IRA is separate from you and we as the trustees sign in the name of the IRA, but we don't sign in the name of the IRA until the client has signed as the IRA account holder, read and approved. The read and approved by the client authorizes us to execute in the name of the IRA. Just so you know, that's really the escrow side of it. When we're going through the, the escrow process, we are, we are going to be the ones at closing signing for the IRA, whether it's the buyer or the seller. But it's always the client that authorizes us by signing read and approved. Without the client's signature, we don't execute it. Okay, we know the disqualified persons. Investment timeline, this is really um, very similar timeline to any other cash deal would be. You need to have the account open. Like I said, it's online, it's 20 minutes. The funding of the account typically takes about two weeks on a transfer or a rollover. Step three, finding the investment. Finding the investment step is always step one because it's the client, your client as the realtor, you say, hey, look at this. This is a great property. You should invest with this. Um, if you need to get a mortgage that takes a while to get the mortgage, we go through the um, escrow process that makes uh, quickly easy when you've got the cash in there. And I just like to say, you know, you should talk to your clients, whether you're the client looking for your SEP to buy something, or it's your client and you're making the commission from selling that property, at representing the buyer, for example, um, you still, you get the commission. So that's, that's good for your business. And it also helps your client to invest more in real estate, which helps you and if they're your client and you're a realtor, they probably like investing in real estate. And they probably don't know that their old retirement account, their old 401k could be investing in a physical property, taking in rental income. That's good information. And this is my closing here down at Restaurant Row. And um, are there any questions? I hope I didn't go too long. Alan, you got questions? You always have questions. Uh, no, not. You ready not, to give this not, presentation next time? Not even. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you Hi, very I much. Have, I have a question. Yes. Hi, this is Julia. Thank you for your presentation. So thanks. As I was listening, I was just considering the different investment options in real estate for an investor and REITs came to mind. Um, can you just briefly go over what would be in what scenario you might want to invest in this self-directed IRA versus a REIT, you know, especially if it's a long-term investment where you're not touching it and kind of like leave it and forget it type of deal. Um, right. So REITs are a security. It's not buying a specific property. And often that is it depends on the other custodian, right? If you have Fidelity, for example, or Schwab, they're a brokerage house and they make money by 
selling and buying and selling mutual funds, securities. A REIT is many different properties held in a security. So it's like buying stock in a company. Um, so you may or may not need a self-directed account to buy, to have your IRA buy a REIT. And that is a type of real estate, but it's not a specific property. So they still can go... Any investment has an upside and a downside. And when you own a physical property, the upside is greater. You know, the downside would be a fire, maybe you could have insurance on something, but the REIT is a type of investment that is held in real estate, but it is shares of a company. So that's basically what I would say. And it doesn't have the tax. That's exactly. Yeah, that's the biggest thing also in my mind. All right. All right, Dean, thank you very much. All right, uh, thanks, Dan. Um, just to close this out real quick, um, as you can see, there's a lot of nuances with this type of alternative retirement plans. And um, that's why you would hire an, a company like New Direction to help with compliance and keeping us uh, maintain that tax um, shelter, right? If you um, one thing I like about Dan is that he practices what he preaches. He also has a self-directed IRA that I believe he owns real estate in. And I do also. So if, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Dan or myself. Um, let me stop sharing this. And I guess maybe I shouldn't have done that. But, but yeah, I guess hopefully what everybody gets out of this is that... Um, the self-directed IRA and these alternative tools are great for, um, for us as realtors because we should be planning for retirement. And two, there are other sources of equity for our clients to buy real estate, whether it be a self-directed IRA, set plan, or even um, kind of getting off topic, but say they have an employee 401k plan that they've saved up. Sometimes you can tap into that to buy uh, like a primary residence if the plan allows it. But anyway, thanks for tuning in um, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Alan.